you've had a look at your uh, at a summary of your evidence to be presented before uh, this committee, and do you confirm that you agree with the contents of this summary? Yes, I do. Now, can you tell uh, Madam Chair how is it that you came to study uh, nutrition and science? So, uh, my introduction to nutrition science came through an article that I was um, assigned to do at the time I was a, doing a series of investigative food stories for uh, Gourmet Magazine. Um, and my editor assigned me one on trans fats. What were trans fats? I had no idea, and most people didn't at that time. And I wrote a story uh, about trans fats that sort of was explosive at the time and was um, and led to a book contract um, and so that was my introduction to the world of fats and it turned out to be a fascinating one for me because fat is of course what we all obsess about most in nutrition how much fat to eat what kinds of fat good fat bad fat low fat non-fat and this seemed uh, and it seemed upon initial inspection that we might have gotten it completely wrong that our nutrition policy might have gotten it completely upside down and backwards as to what we should be eating. Um, as a journalist, I was also very intrigued by this story because I um, met a number of scientists who told me seemingly unbelievable stories, stories about vegetable oil executives visiting their offices and trying to shut down their work or having their papers yanked from journals, or um, I heard stories about people getting disinvited from conferences. I heard things that, uh, I had conversations where um, somebody would say, I, I, scientific researchers who would say, I, I can't talk to you about fat. I, I can't if you're going to take that line. I'm, I had people hang up on me and I would get off the phone sort of shaking thinking I've been investigating the mob. <laughs> this, is, this is not science. So this as an, a journalist, it um, piques your interest. You know there's a story there. And so um, at that time I had um, no preconceptions. I was, had been a vegetarian for nearly two decades and the last thing I thought I would do is to uh, write a book as I did, but um, that was the beginning of a journey that lasted then nearly a decade of research uh, following upon that. Madam Chair, that was uh, page 166 on the, uh, in, in the bundle that I referred you to. Now, Stachos, you are the writer of the book of a book. What is the title of that book? The Big Fat Surprise. And could you tell us uh, about the uh, the book? The book is a an analysis of the last fifty years of nutrition policy, particularly as it relates to dietary fat and cholesterol. And it looks not just at the science, but also the policy, the personalities, um, the politics the influence of industry, it turns out to be a story of science but also about political science, the role of politics and how science has been, has played out in this field. Um, my favorite description of it is, as from The Economist, is that a nutrition thriller, which I've been told might be an oxymoron, <laughs> but I believe <laughs> uh, it is meant for a general audience. Now. What was the nature of the research you did before and during the writing of the book? So my research really took 10 years, um, and that's because there is an enormous body of scientific literature to read and study. Um, so I read literally thousands and thousands of papers, um, every paper that I could find. I read not only the papers themselves, but I read all the critiques of the papers by the scientists so that I could understand the debate going on in science among scientists. And I did not rely on summary statements or review papers, but I instead went back to all the original data itself, the original papers, and then sometimes back to the original data themselves. I mean, this involved in many cases when scientists were trying to hide their data. I went, to the, some of it was published in foreign language publications, and I hunted those down and got those translated. Um, and I attended conferences. I interviewed 
hundreds of uh, industry executives to find out what was the role of industry in this, um, in this story. I interviewed hundreds of scientists, um, most of the top scientists working in the field, many of them more than once, uh, scores of them overseas. Um, I spent hours, I traveled to visit scientists all over the United States and spent hours with them going through their correspondence and their files to find letters. The unique perspective that I brought is as a journalist, this is what a journalist does. A journalist spends all day long researching and interviewing people and transcribing that. I brought, I think, the objectivity that a journalist is supposed to bring and the ability to critique and analyze, um, which I think is unique. So I put the science in kind of this larger context of politics and history. Um, and I really think there's no other book, except for perhaps one by another journalist named Gary Taubes, there's really no other book that makes that kind of comprehensive analysis of the science in its larger context. Um, I have been told by um, scientists at, uh, at Stanford and Berkeley that, that if I were in their course, I should have received a PhD for my book, that it certainly required enough work. I think, I don't know if, you know, it's interesting the version that you have here, that blue version doesn't have the footnotes because they consider that they wanted people not to be intimidated, I think, by them. But these alone are the footnotes of the references of the book. Um, so nearly a quarter of the book is references, thousands upon thousands of references. Um, so I think I bring a very unique perspective through my research to this field. Now, Mr. Tyshaw, can you tell Madam Che how was the book received and you know, has it been reviewed? It has been reviewed. Um, so this is some of, it got quite a lot of acclaim when it came out. It was reviewed, it was named the number one science book by The Economist um, for 2014. It was named a, a best book of 2014 by The Wall Street Journal, by Forbes, by Library Journal, which is to turn, tells libraries in the United States which books they should uh, order. Kirkus Reviews is the most prestigious um, book review agency in uh, the U.S and it was a finalist for the Investigative Reporters and Editors Award. I think what's unusual is that you know, usually books by lay people are not reviewed by um, medical journals, and mine was reviewed by two medical journals extremely favorably. One was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which is a premier journal in the United States, and it said every, this book should be read by every nutritional science professional, and all scientists should read it as an example of how limited science can become federal policy. Well researched, clearly written, Teicholz compiled a historical treatise on how scientific belief versus evidence, non-governmental organizations, food manufacturers, government agencies, and moneyed interests promised more than they could deliver, and in the process quite possibly contributed to the current worldwide obesity epidemic. And the B ooh, I'm sorry. Uh, and the BMJ, um, which is the British Medical Journal, by its former editor in chief, wrote, uh, "Impressive. This book shook me. Teichels has done a remarkable job in analyzing the weak science, strong personalities, invested interests, and political expediency." That's actually he wrote a three-page piece on my book and its implications. That's just a short excerpt. Alice Waters is a famous chef. I don't know if you know her. <laughs> Uh, but just another example of the breadth of its impact. Um, and um, The Economist, as I said, called it a nutrition thriller. This is not an obvious page turner, but it is. The vilification of fat, argues Teichel, Ms. Teichel's, does not stand up to closer examination. It was extremely well reviewed by any organization or newspaper or media outlet that reviewed it. Um, and I should just say this one quote, like a bloodhound. Um, <laughs> I want to just say something about that, which is true that this is another quality that a journalist can bring, which is journalists are supposed to be dogged and they are supposed to be skeptical, um, which is not true in every profession. A, a journalist is supposed to relentlessly ask questions and not cease till they get to the bottom of a matter. And I feel like that is what I have done in this book. So it's been 
uh, that's one Nobel, I've had actually another Nobel laureate who has um, sent me uh, kind notices about my book. And I want to speak one, um, a little bit to the factual reliability of the book because I, I think there was some pre-trial um, notice about how it would be impossible to fact check my book. So I want to assure everybody that my book was fact checked by two professional fact checkers. And then after publication, um, some uh, troll, <laughs> a, a person I should say hostile to me, went and checked every single reference in the book and discovered that I had indeed made some small errors of page numbers and words that I had gotten wrong and some things were wrongly cited. And I went through for the paperback edition that you have and I corrected all of those, um, those errors. And I also want to say that um, all of, all of those errors, none of those errors resulted in any material change in any of the assertions of the book itself, so that it remains sound. And also that there has been no s published serious critique of my book by any nutrition academic. Um, so I think that it remains um, a strong contribution to the record in this field. The exposure that it's received, I mean, I, I, it's, it's been the topic of dozens of TV shows, full episodes and, and hour-long episodes and ABC News um, and CNN and all over the world, really, um, and hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles. It was, this, um, it was entirely the basis of this now, I think, for some of us at least, iconic time cover story on uh, sort of butter is back. That was all based on my book. The New Scientist is a UK publication, also wrote a store cover story based on my book. Uh, it's the Wall Street Journal article that I, ex it was a piece that I wrote, excerpted on my book that was the most emailed story in recent history in that newspaper that anybody could remember. Um, these are more cover stories from Brazil. Uh, the listener is, I believe, New Zealand. Um, so it received a tremendous amount of coverage all over, all over the world. And I want to say it also has had an impact on government. So I was invited by the Canadian Senate last year to give an hour of testimony to the Senate committee that, is, that was charged with looking at their dietary guidelines. And they've just announced, actually, that particular committee's announced they think their guidelines need a, a complete rehaul um, and that they intend to do that. In the US, my book, this is excerpts from emails that were obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests by um, a journalist in the US. And we discovered that the US Dietary Guideline Committee, the most recent one in 2015, that they read that Wall Street Journal article, discovered that, saw the amount of attention my book was getting, um, in addition to a major meta-analysis on saturated fat that had come out that year, and decided at that late point in time, when they were not planning any more systematic reviews, to then undertake a systematic review of saturated fats. Um, which they did, but they were not at that point. They were going to consider it sort of settled science until, uh, until my book was published. Now, Ms. Teichholz, yes. much has been said in these proceedings about the diet heart hypothesis. And as a result of your, mm -hmm. your research, what, are you, what can you tell this honorable committee about this hypothesis? Yes, well, so, the diet higher hypothesis, how did it all begin? How did we come to have this idea that saturated in fat and cholesterol cause heart disease? Um, like any idea, it was born in a moment in time. It didn't always exist, although we in this room have lived with it for all of our lives. But it began in the 1950s in the United States when there was a, uh, a rising panic over um, the increase in heart disease, which has come from seemingly out of nowhere in the early 1900s, as you can see on that graph, and had become the number one killer in America. So mm -hmm. men in the prime of life were uh, being felled on the golf course at work, and nobody knew why. Their parents had not suffered 
this problem. President Eisenhower himself was out of the Oval Office. He had a heart attack in 1955. He was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. So the entire nation, their attention is riveted, focused on this issue, what causes heart disease? And there were a number of competing explanations at the time. Some people thought it was vitamin deficiency. Some people thought it was auto exhaust. Other people thought it was stress, the increasing the stressful lifestyle. Um, but there was one theory that was proposed by a pathologist at the University of Minnesota named Ansel Benjamin Keyes. His theory was that it was saturated fats. Saturated fat and dietary cholesterol would raise your blood cholesterol, clog your arteries, and give you a heart attack. That was called the diet heart hypothesis, and that was his idea. Um, and Ansel Keyes was um, a, a unique personality. I mean, there's sort of various theories of history about, you know, is history, does history, is it formed by guns, germs, and steel, or is there sort of the great man theory of history is that it's formed by powerful personalities? And I think in the story of nutrition, it is really the, the, the great man theory of history is at work here. He was an extremely uh, forceful personality. He was uh, considered to be, in, had a kind of indomitable will. He would um, argue people to death. He was, um, his less admiring colleagues called him arrogant and ruthless, but he was um, extremely determined and, and had an unwavering faith in his own beliefs. And so Ansel Keys was able to get, um, oh, so, all right, so this is a chart that is in the book, but not in your slides. So it's on page 28 of the book. Um, it shows you something about, uh, the reason we, t we talk, we have this chart here is to show you that Ansel Keys was more interested in being right than he was interested in being a good scientist, um, I think is fair to say. And this was one of his early efforts. So at first, before he thought it was saturated fats, he, he, he thought all fats caused heart disease. So this is in the early um, uh, 1950s. And he makes this chart that he goes around presenting at scientific conferences, showing that fat, the consumption of fat, seems to be perfectly correlated with heart disease according to these um, countries that he plots on this line. And that's sort of a nice curve, showing increased fat consumption, increased risk of heart disease. And he takes this around to scientific conferences. At one of the conferences he goes to, there's two, um, well, uh, uh, in Geneva, actually, um, two biostaticians named Hiroshimi and Hil Hilbo and Hiroshimi. And they noticed that, uh, well, they looked around in Geneva, first of all, in Geneva, where they were eating a lot of fat. They have a high fatty diet, and there was very low rates of heart disease. And they thought there were something just intuitively didn't seem right. And they thought, well, why, why is he choosing this country, just these countries? Why don't we go and look at all the countries for which we have this data? And they published this chart, which is on page 34 of the book. The red circles are the countries that um, Ansel Keys chose. And you can see, but if you plot the data for, data for all the countries, there is no correlation, or only the weakest of correlations between fat consumption and heart disease. When these two statisticians showed this chart, it absolutely infuriated Ansel Keys. Um, and he stormed off, and, and it made him even more determined, rather than accepting that he, was, uh, that, that he might be wrong, it made him even more go to, determined to go out and, and prove himself right, according to his close colleague, Henry Blackburn. So um, Ansel Keys, um, through the force of his personality, was able to get his ideas implanted into the American Heart Association. So you have to understand, the American Heart Association is, in the, ni in the 1960s, the, the, uh, the National Institute of Health um, is really not a major force in telling people how to eat. So the American Heart Association is really the only group in the United States that tells people how to eat and what kind of lifestyle they should have to avoid a heart attack. In 1960, <coughs> they said there's not enough information. We do not believe there's enough information to tell people how to eat. Um, and they even, the, the members of the nutrition committee even went so far as to sort of wrap 
Diet Heart supporters like Keyes, and they said, they said, people should not take uncompromising stands based on evidence that does not stand up under critical examination. So this is in 1960.